All right. All right, all right, all right. Well, here we go, guys. Hopefully you're on and you can see us. And let's go live, shall we? All right, welcome to Fellowship Students. I hope you guys are doing well. If you are logged on with us, then I'm so glad that you're here. Um, let me just say, this is obviously a little bit different, isn't it? We're uh, seeking to go live over Facebook and uh, try to make that work so that we can continue to meet together and uh, and do what we normally do. So tonight we are going to be continuing in our Heroes of the Faith uh, series, and we're going to be back in Hebrews chapter 11, looking at the passage that Pastor Brad led us through on Sunday morning. So if you have not done so already, go ahead and grab your Bible and turn to Hebrews 11. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on and what we're going to do. And uh, then we'll dive into the passage in just a minute. Um, so we are going to be doing this, Lord willing, um, moving forward until we can come back together. Um, and if this works well tonight, then great. Um, if it doesn't, please get in touch. Um, send me an email uh, or you know, comment on the Facebook Live video just so that we know what's going on and we'll try to make it uh, as best as we can. We'll try to fix whatever we need to fix. Um, if 6.30 isn't a great time for us to do this, if it would be better uh, for households that we meet at 7, then we can also adjust a little bit uh, if we need to. But, uh, but let me know uh, what's going on and we'll go from there. Um, so let me just do this. All right. So, um, so yeah. So we're gonna seek to keep this going, and uh, and hopefully it'll be a good time. We are gonna be doing lots of other things, Lord willing, uh, on uh, social media and Instagram and Facebook. So look for those later. Amy's gonna be joining us after our message tonight. Um, and she's going to be telling us a little bit more about what's going on as well. Um, so stick around for that and hopefully we will have a great time. So tell you what we are going to do. We are going to go ahead and pray and then we're going to seek to get after it in God's word. So where you are right now, even virtually, go ahead and close your eyes and, uh, and let's pray together so that we can focus. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you, Lord, for uh, just the beautiful sunshine outside that we uh, got to enjoy and for just the little boost that that gives us. Um, Lord, we recognize that we are in just crazy times. Um, Lord, having to be uh, in our homes all the time and having to, uh, to stay home from school and work and all sorts of things. Uh, Lord, it's not normal, so help us to, to adjust. Lord, I pray that you would give us great patience and help us as we get along with our families, Lord, to treat everyone with love and respect and to, even in our very own homes, be great models and examples of what it is to be a Christ follower. Father, I pray that as we get into your word again tonight, uh, Lord, that you would help us, that you would uh, give us insight by your spirit as we study Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, Lord, that you would really encourage each and every one of us. Father, thank you for technology that makes it possible, and I pray that uh, tonight would just be a real blessing to all of us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, if you didn't know, this is my home. Um, I'm coming to you from my living room, kind of took some time to set up a little bit of a studio uh, earlier on today. I am also texting uh, back and forth with Amy because she's in her home, in her apartment, um, and I'm making sure that this is all going right and uh, that you guys can hear me and everything. Um, so if you see me looking down, it's probably to, to uh, check a text from Amy or something if anything goes wrong. Um, but yeah, it's crazy times, isn't it? And uh, Hopefully we won't have to do this too much longer, but for now we will. So hopefully you have your Bibles. Go ahead and open them if you haven't done already to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to go ahead and uh, read the passage that Pastor Brad gave us or brought to us on Sunday morning. So that's Hebrews chapter 11 verses 20 through 22. So let's read that together. It says this, by faith, 
Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and he worshipped leaning on his staff, on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. Now on Sunday morning, Pastor Brad led us through a message and a sermon that he entitled a forward focused faith. And so that's where we're going to be tonight as well. We're going to think a little bit more uh, about what Pastor Brad brought to us on Sunday morning and what it is to have a forward focused faith, as well as how to deal with anxiety in times like these. But let's do what we've done for the, for the, the first number of sessions in our series. Let's go ahead and back up. Let's do some good context. Let's do some good hermeneutics. So let's review a little bit, right? Remembering the context of where we're at in Hebrews, right? So number one, the author, we don't know exactly who it is. Um, there are lots of different opinions on who the author may have been, and that's all well and good. But the reality is, according to scripture, we don't know. There's no clear indication of that. The author doesn't name uh, themselves as they write the book, so we just don't know. Um, to say one way or the other would simply be speculation. The audience we do know was primarily Jewish believers. Now I say primarily because there were uh, a smattering of um, Gentile believers that would have been mixed in, that would have heard this, uh, but primarily it's written to Jewish believers. And the reason that we can say that is the author expects the reader to have really quite a formidable knowledge of the Old Testament and law and how that works. And so Gentiles, for the most part, wouldn't really have known that stuff, um, but Jews should have. And so that's why we believe it was written primarily to the Jews. Um, what's their situation? Well, as we read through the book, we realize that the people that are hearing this, the audience, they were facing religious persecution. Physical persecution hadn't uh, begun just yet. We don't see any indication of that in the book that they had started to endure physical persecution yet. But we do see that they're considering whether this faith is something that they need to keep going with. Uh, as Pastor Brad said on uh, Sunday morning, some of them were considering whether or not they would continue in the way. And yet the writer of Hebrews says that to go back on the faith that they have would be like to trample the blood of Christ underfoot. The writer of Hebrews is trying to help the, the audience know, this is not a, a small thing that you guys are considering doing. You guys need to keep going. You need to keep pressing on. And that also factors into Hebrews chapter 11 for us. The location of the audience where it was written to, again, it's unknown. Uh, there's some schools of thought that says it could have been, or say it could have been Jerusalem. Some say other parts of uh, the Middle East and the world at that time. Again, we don't specifically know. There's nothing in the text that gives us a clear answer on that. Um, but again, that, while it would be helpful to know, isn't vital. The date, again, unknown. Uh, we think it's likely before 62 AD. The reason for that being uh, in 62 AD, there was a particular, uh, a particular Roman emperor who came to power and he started persecuting the Christians in that, in that time very, very fiercely. And we don't read about that in Hebrew, so I doubt it's actually happening. And then also we, in 70 AD, uh, you have the, the kind of destruction of Jerusalem itself. And so that isn't mentioned either. So we think it predates both of those things. So more than likely before 62 AD. The general message of the book is one that is reaffirming Christ who he is, the son of God, and what he came to do in his life, death, and resurrection work and his ministry here on earth. And it also is reaffirming the Christian faith in general. It's bolstering believers of the day and encouraging them to keep on going. In chapters 1 through 10, we saw this already with Pastor Ryan. You've got doctrinal instruction, and then chapters 11 through 13, it's practical exhortation. And so that's kind of how the book generally divides up. But 
Knowing that context, now we start to get a little bit more specific with regard to Hebrews chapter 11. We're dealing with the chapter of faith. And so right at the beginning, Pastor Ryan very helpfully defined faith for us. He helped us think that through what faith defined looked like. And we used the quote from uh, Billy Graham, where Billy said, faith simply means believing that something is true and then committing our lives to it. And so we recognize that faith has two parts. It has a belief aspect and also a commitment aspect. It's not merely a mental assent to facts or reality. It is this reality of you know what you know and therefore you act on it. You commit yourself to, uh, to put that into practice in your life. Um, and that's what faith is. Biblical faith is not just knowledge. It's an action word, so to speak. It's a verb in that sense. And so in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, we've already worked through a number of different uh, characters and different examples. So let's quickly review that for the sake of context as well. Again, in verses one through three, you have faith defined. And then in verse four, we see Abel. And we recognize that he had a faith that worships. Uh, in verses five and six, you have Enoch, and he had a faith that walked with the Lord for over 300 years, according to Genesis. An incredible walk with the Lord, incredible relationship, one that God decided was too good to, to let end. And so Enoch didn't face death. He, in, in fact, was brought home to be with the Lord. Uh, how cool is that? Um, in verse seven, we see Noah talked about, and we recognize that Noah had a faith that worked. He was given instruction, and even though we don't, many people believe that he didn't even know what rain was, he maybe had never even seen rain before, he built an ark to prepare for a flood, to prepare for coming judgment. And likewise with Abel, we need to have a, a faith that worships God. We need to see our faith boil over in our worship and our expression of love toward the Lord. We should have a faith like Enoch that is prepared to walk with him faithfully day by day. And like Noah, we should have a faith that works, that prepares for what is coming. And we've been told what's coming. One day the Lord is going to judge. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 tells us that it's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. And so we need to prepare. We need to work to make sure that we are ready for that coming judgment as well, just like Noah did. These are all examples in the faith. And then last uh, or a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Ryan led us through verses 8 through 19, where you look primarily at Abraham. Uh, Sarah and Isaac are mentioned in there as well. But we noted with Abraham that he had the faith of a sojourner. Abraham was a guy who had to leave his homeland and he was going in search of a land that God would give him that God had prepared for him and his people, but he didn't know what that really looked like or where it would lead him, but yet he went in faith. And we know that he also was a guy who had the faith of a finisher. Abraham, we know, kept the faith all the way through his life, right to his dying day. And he wasn't just looking for a new land physically on earth. He was looking for a new home spiritually with the Lord. He was looking for his forever eternal home where the most high God dwells. And that's what kept him going. He was looking for that city that was not built by human hands, but rather a divine builder and designer. And so we noted those things about Abraham. But now we come to where we're at tonight. We're come to verse 20 in Hebrews chapter 11. And there are three guys that are primarily talked about in this passage as we think about a forward focused faith. And again, those three guys are Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And if you go back to Genesis and you look at their stories uh, that are given to us there in Genesis, you see that each one of these guys had a faith of their own. They weren't just, uh, they didn't just get the credit of the faith of their parents or Abraham, for example. They were, they are recorded here as having faith themselves, a personal faith. And that's a good note for each one of us that, um, guys, wherever you're at, if, if you are just relying on mom and dad's faith, that's not enough. We don't get that, their faith credited to our accounts. We need to choose to follow God ourselves and to put faith into action 
personally through repentance and faith. And so if you're watching this tonight and you haven't done that ever yourself to this point, then I encourage you, there is no better time than right now tonight to consider and to put your trust in what Christ has done. But we see that these three guys, they had a forward focused faith. They had a faith that was not dependent necessarily on their own circumstances and right where they were. They had a faith that was characterized by being forward focused, even though what they were promised, they didn't see in their own lifetime. They trusted God for what he had promised, knowing that he is a good God. He is, he is a faithful God and he will bring to pass what he promises and they put their trust in him. And Pastor Brad asked us that a question along those lines. He asked us to consider how do we have forward focused faith? And I wonder how you responded to that. If you'd be so bold, then go ahead and shoot a comment in uh, on this video so that we can know and and engage that way. But as we think about these guys who had a forward focused faith, I want to think of someone else who had a forward forward focused faith. You see, all of Hebrews. You could sum it up in one word, and that word would be better. And if you wanted to, to expand on that a little bit, it would be a simple sentence. Jesus is better. And so I want to think about our ultimate or better example of a forward-focused faith, one who was constantly looking ahead and who had faith in God. And that forward-focused faith that or that ultimate example, I wonder if you know who it is, right? Sunday school answers apply here. Let me hear you say it. Jesus, right? Jesus is our ultimate and better example of one who had a forward focused faith. In the midst of trying times, this becomes very evident. We're in the midst of a difficult time right now. Things are not normal and we're having to adjust and figure out how to do life. But we are not anywhere close to what Jesus had to face in some of, or some of the things that Jesus had to face in his lifetime in ministry. And I want to take you to a particular point in his ministry, and that's to the Garden of Gethsemane. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and just flick over to Matthew chapter 26. And I just want to help you see something really quick, right? In Matthew chapter 26, verses 39 and 42, we have Jesus, and he's, he's praying, and we'll read it in just a second. But I want you to notice his submission to the Father, and that comes because he has a forward-focused faith. Right. Let's look at verse 39 of Matthew chapter 26 together. It says this going a little farther. He fell. He being Jesus fell face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Get this yet, not as I will, but as you will. Now, why would he say that? Why do we observe Jesus to be so submissive to the father he knows full well what's coming the very well within the next couple of hours right he knows what's happening and that's why he's praying let this cup pass from me yet he says not my will but yours and if you look down at verse 42 again a second time he jesus went away and prayed father if this cannot pass unless i drink it your will be done what I want you to see, guys, is that Jesus was submissive to the Father, ultimately because he trusted the Father. And he knew that what the Father was asking of him needed to come about. He had a forward-focused faith. He knew what the benefits of what he was going to do was, and so he trusted the Father to go through it, as difficult as it was going to be. Even the writer of Hebrews himself remarks on this in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The writer of Hebrews helps us see how Jesus had a forward focused faith. Let's read it together. You should have your finger in Hebrews chapter 11, so it's right there. But uh, verses 1 and 2, look at what it says. Therefore, since we also have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, right? So 
we know these verses. These verses are very familiar to us. Um, and the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, look at Jesus. Let's run with endurance. Let's not give up. Let's keep our eyes on him forward focused. But look at what he says, continuing on in verse two. Speaking of Jesus, he says, for the joy that was set before him. So Jesus was looking forward, right? Forward focused faith. He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus is our better example of a forward focused faith than even Isaac or Jacob or Joseph. He had a faith that was forward focused and so submissive to what God was asking of him that he was willing to go to the cross for you and for me. And if you didn't, if you don't think that that's a big deal, the, we know from other parts of scripture that it says that he who knew no sin became sin for us. He took on what wasn't his own to bear. He took on our guilt and our shame, the sin weight that should have been on our shoulders. He willingly took it on himself, took it to the cross, paid the price, endured the wrath of God for the joy that was set before him. For the fact that he knew that by doing that, he was providing a way of salvation for those who would repent and believe in him. And those that would choose to do that, who would put their faith in Christ, he would have an inheritance. And the family of God, the kingdom of God would grow. The joy that was set before him, he had a forward focused faith. And so he was willing to endure. As we look at all of the examples in Hebrews, they are incredible, but don't ever forget the writer of Hebrews' main point for the whole book. Jesus is better. And so as we think about that, we're going to continue on. And so on Sunday morning, again, Pastor Brad, he, he took us through this with the three guys in Hebrews, but then he also helped shift our attention a little bit. Because as we think about having a forward focused faith, sometimes it's easy to be overwhelmed with fear and anxiety, especially when we're going through difficult times. And so he took our attention to Philippians chapter four, verses four through nine. And so I wanna go there with you as well. And uh, let's look a little bit at this, right? So Philippians chapter four, verses four through nine. Go ahead and turn there if you haven't done so already. Again, let me catch you up on some of the context, right? Paul is writing this to a little church in Philippi that he had uh, has done ministry with and has been involved with for, for many years now. Um, he helped to plant the church, but he's writing to them uh, from prison or at least home arrest in Rome. So his circumstances aren't exactly good, but he's writing to them to encourage them to keep going, to endure, to, to keep pressing on in spite of the religious persecution that they're facing. And he's thanking them for a gift, right? And so in chapter four, as he's already been through a lot of different things, chapter one, he's thanking them for their gift and encouraging them to, to stand strong. Chapter two, we see him kind of lay out an incredible example of who Christ is and that we are to have the same mindset of Christ and we're to shine like lights or stars in the universe. He gives examples of guys who've done that, Timothy, Epaphroditus, and he goes on in chapter three, talking about how we are to, to strive and to press on toward the goal to which Christ is calling us heavenward. And then you get to chapter four and he starts to, to give some practical instruction and counsel and he gets into verse four and that's where Pastor Brad picked up. We're going to do the same. So chapter four, verse four of Philippians, it says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. 
Again, just an incredible passage from the Apostle Paul to help us understand how are we to have a forward-focused faith and how is that going to affect how we find ourselves thinking in difficult times. I I would think that the the Apostle Paul would be encouraging the Philippians to also have a faith that is forward-focused. And I know that he did because in chapter 3, that's what he does. He tells them to strive for the goal that's set before them, the call of God heavenward, right? So there's a forward focus there. But that forward-focused faith needs to work its way out in real-life circumstance. And Paul is grounding it for them because here's the deal. Again, the Philippians, they were enduring religious persecution. They were having to deal with all sorts of stuff. And I'm sure they had every right in many ways to feel anxious. And yet Paul says, guys, no, no, no. Rejoice, rejoice. And don't be anxious about anything, but instead through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. He's encouraging them. He's helping them understand there's another way to think. There's a better way to think. And so I want to take a minute and just work through those with you as well. So Pastor Brad gave us seven imperatives that I'm calling divine peace for anxious times, right? Seven things that help us understand how we can have divine peace in the midst of anxious times. First of all, let's look at the passage, rejoice in the Lord. This is, this helps us keep our mind in the game. So often we can just fly off the handle and be so distracted by so many things, but instead Paul says, Hey, no, 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 no. Don't be distracted. Rejoice in the Lord. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter if things are going really well or if things are really tough right now, rejoice in the Lord. And then, Even though it might seem like a mistake for Paul to do it, he repeats it, but it's not a mistake. He tells them again, rejoice in the Lord. This is, this is Paul putting emphasis on this. This is Paul saying, Hey guys, this is really important. You got to pay attention to this. No matter what's going on, rejoice, choose to rejoice. I'm reminded of the psalmists of old, right? Who, who would write laments. And we've talked about this before Psalms of lament where they're just pouring out their heart and they're saying things like, woe is me and all sorts of stuff. And yet time and time and time again, the Psalmists, there comes a point in the midst of that song where they say, but I will choose to remember your faithfulness. I will choose to remember your goodness. And they choose to rejoice. And so I would encourage us to think likewise and to do the same, just as Paul encouraged the Philippians, just as the psalmists encouraged those who sung those songs, choose to rejoice, choose to dwell on God's faithfulness and goodness. But Paul keeps going in Philippians 4, and he goes on and and he says in verse 5, let your graciousness be known to all, or let your graciousness be known to everyone. You know, this is one of the things that that sometimes I struggle with, if I'm being honest. You know, it takes a lot to get me really stressed. Um, I'm a fairly easygoing guy, pretty laid back. But when I get stressed, my graciousness, it tanks. My, I, I, I get short. I get snippy. The ones who see it most are not going to be you guys. It's going to be the people who live in this home with me, my wife and my kids. They're going to be the, the ones who bear the brunt of that. And And there are times when I need to be reminded of what Paul is saying, that even in the midst of hard times and anxious times, I need to be gracious. I need to choose to rejoice and allow that to work its way out in how I treat others as well with grace and respect. He goes on and he tells us that for those who do that, remember the Lord is near. He's at, he's at hand, he's close by, and he wants to meet us there. He goes on, he says, do not worry or do not be anxious about anything, or as Pastor Brad said, be anxious for nothing. Now, again, nothing is what nothing means, right? We are to be anxious about nothing. But let's just take a minute to think about that word anxious again, because again, you might be sitting there thinking, well, Tim, that's nice to say, but I'm, I am anxious right now. I'm looking at what's going on in the world and, and it makes me anxious. Well, let me just say, what, what is Paul saying here? Is he saying that we shouldn't be uh, aware of what's going on in the world, that we shouldn't be concerned about things that are happening around us? Not really. 
Because again, Paul used that same language when he spoke of Timothy having great concern for the church in Philippian, in Philippi, right? It's the same word, anxious or concern. And so when anxious, when we talk about that word anxious, we're talking about a care, right? And if it's a care for others, like Timothy had, that's good. If it's an inward fretting for self, if it's just a, I need to be protected, I'm only concerned about me, that's bad. That's what Paul is saying. No, 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 guys, you are not to be anxious about anything. Why, by the way? Well, if we're anxious, then what does that show? It shows that we don't really trust God. It shows that we don't trust him to be our good father, to provide what we need when we need it. And so we need to be reminded that we are to be anxious about nothing. Five, let your requests be known to God. Oftentimes for me, anxiety is fueled when I'm not doing this, when I'm not praying, when I'm not spending time with the Lord, when I'm, when I'm thinking I got to do it all by myself. I got to bear the weight of it on my own shoulders. And yet Paul is saying, no, 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 let your requests be known to God. Cry out to him. Tell him how you feel. He already knows and he can handle your emotions. So share that with him. It's incredible how spending time with God through prayer and reading of his word can bring comfort in times of trouble. And then finally, or six, he says, dwell on these things. And the, there's the eight-sided boundaries for peace, right? So those eight things in verse eight, um, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, morally excellent, and praiseworthy, those are the things that we dwell on. So if your mind is getting distracted by all sorts of other things, choose to refocus choose like the psalmist to remember the goodness of god the faithfulness of god choose to rejoice choose to focus on what is helpful instead of what's just going to bring us further into despair and then finally practice these things practice these things it it seems so obvious but in verse 9 paul says do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the god of peace will be with you it seems so basic but we need to hear it because if all we do is know it, but we don't actually actually ever practice it or live it out, then it's just head knowledge. And it's not really helpful. It's not going to be worthwhile. It's not gonna, it's not gonna help us get through our day. And so we need to choose to practice these things and put them into effect. But again, as we're thinking about divine peace for anxious times, I want to take a minute and just think about the peace giver. Again, kind of tag team in what I said from Hebrews, right? The whole theme of Hebrews, Jesus is better. Who do you think the peace giver is that I'm talking about? Everybody on three, one, two, three, Jesus, right? Jesus is our peace giver. In John 14, verse 27, one of my favorite verses in scripture, Jesus speaking to his disciples at a very stressful time for them, turns around and he says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. He is the giver of peace. In Philippians 4, verse 7, you see it there that we're talking about the peace of God. And in Colossians 3, 15, it, it describes it as the peace of Christ that we need to have so that it rules over our hearts and our minds and our entire body. That's what needs to rule and dwell in us. And this peace comes from no other place but him himself. He is the source. And so if you're trying to find peace in anywhere else, it's not going to work. You need to go to him. Even in Psalm 29, verse 11, this is an incredible psalm. And the psalmist is describing God's sovereignty over all of creation. But in verses 10 and 11, he, he kind of just narrows in on God and, and reminds us of some things. And I want to read it to you. Look at it. Uh, it says this, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned king forever. So no matter what's going on, and by the way, how applicable is this to us today? No matter what's going on in our world, the Lord sits enthroned. He is an office throne. No one's uh, impeached him or deposed him of his position. He is on the throne. He's in control. And look at verse 11. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses his people with peace. 
This is what our God does. He is the peace giver. And for his children through repentance and faith, for those of us who claim Christ as our own, he gladly and willingly and wants to give peace in the midst of difficult times. So we learn to run to him. Again, thinking of this peace giver, I'm reminded of a passage that typically we uh, kind of reserve for Christmas, right? It's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. But it's interesting because this is where we see Jesus given his title. Uh, let's read it together, verse 6 of Isaiah 9. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. You see, Jesus is the peace giver. This is who he is. That's one of his own titles. He's the Prince of Peace. He's got it to give away, to give freely. And this is the God that we know. This is the God that we can go to for comfort in times of trial. But I also want you to note, thinking about a forward-focused faith, how forward focused verse seven of Isaiah chapter nine is. Look at what this says. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. Notice how forward focused this is. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. We have a peace giver who is ready to meet us in times of struggle and in, in times of strife and all sorts of things. And we just need to go to him. We need to start demonstrating a forward focused faith that works its way out in real life, knowing how to deal with these sort of issues. But we know that the one that we depend on is not ourselves knowing how to do this. It's him. He is the source of our peace. He's the source of our faith. And so we go to him. As we kind of wrap things up, I've got a couple of questions for us to consider um, as we finish up tonight. For us, right? What about us? Do we have and live out a forward focused faith? I mean, when you think about it in your own life, just take a minute. You're probably sitting on your phone or in front of a computer. There may not be many people around. Just stop and pause. Does a forward-focused faith characterize you? If I'm being honest, there are times when my focus is so narrow and it's just on the now, and I need to get my eyes off my circumstances and put them back on my God so that I can live this out. But if I do have a forward-focused faith, what would that faith look like? What would a forward-focused for, forward faith look like? I think it would look like being at peace. I think it would look like us being able to walk through situations and circumstances and people coming to us and saying, how are you so calm in the midst of this? How are you so okay with what's going on? And our, our, the, the, the beauty of that is that it gives us the privilege to be able to say, well, you know what? This isn't anything of me. This is because I have faith in God. And I know that he's in control and I know one day he's going to wrap everything up and he wins and I get to go spend eternity with him. So even if this life gets a little bit tough right here and right now, I'm okay with that because I win. The benefit of enduring, the benefit of having faith that lasts far outweighs the troubles that we will endure here. Paul himself says, you know, for these light and momentary afflictions are storing up for, our, for ourselves treasures in heaven, right? That's what a forward-focused faith would look like. One that trusts God in spite of what's going on around us. But in the midst of such crazy times, how can we be sure that we have a pe the peace that's described in Philippians 4? How can you be sure of that? Well, again, I think you need to go back to the passage. You need to put it into practice. We need to choose to see those seven imperatives and to, to work them out in our own lives. Choose to rejoice. Choose to be gracious. Choose to not, not to be anxious. Choose to dwell on the things that we need to dwell on and practice the things that we need to practice. We need to go and we need to, we need to put these things into effect. You know, when things get crazy, do we allow ourselves 
to be overwhelmed with anxiety or do we stop and choose to think on better things, things that are, as we said earlier, things that are true, things that are just, things that are pure and, and noble and honorable and commendable and lovely. Do you choose to stop when you're starting to get anxious or do you just allow yourself to spiral? I know that some of us, we may struggle with that. But I also know that if you do struggle with that, if you've ever struggled with anxiety, you know it's not a fun place to be. God is telling us, hey, there's a better way. There's a better thing to think about. There's, there are better things to focus on. And ultimately, that looks like Christ. Choose to think on him. Choose to put our trust in him. So as we respond to tonight's message, I'm going to give you a couple of things and then I'm going to finish up the Facebook live broadcast. Myself and Amy will be back on about five minutes after we're done to discuss any questions that you might have. So don't go away, but let's think about these couple of response questions for you to do right now in the couple of minutes in between. So what can or should I change or do to draw closer to Jesus this week? and demonstrate forward-focused faith. So think that through. And if you have your notebooks, go ahead and write something down so that you can share it with someone later. What is your one big takeaway from tonight's message? As we've thought back through what Pastor Brad presented us to, presented to us on Sunday morning and thought about Jesus, our better example, both in forward-focused faith and um, our, our example of, uh, of the one who gives peace. What's your big takeaway from tonight's message? And then finally, right where you are, take a minute to pray for what's going on in the world and then to pray that God would help you to apply this message. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to finish up our Facebook live feed. We'll be back on in a couple of minutes. I hope you'll join us again. Let me pray. Father God, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for being able to work through Hebrews 11, 20 through 22 and Philippians 4 and consider Lord, the examples of forward focused faith that we can look to. But thank you again for the greater, the better, the ultimate example in Christ who chose to look beyond his current circumstances to what was coming, the joy that was set before him. And he did that to make a way of salvation for us and to please the Father. Thank you, Lord, for that example. And Lord, we thank you for the peace that can be found in your word as we seek to put it into practice, but ultimately the peace that is found in you. Lord, I thank you that you as our Father, you as our King, are the giver of peace. And Lord, I pray that for anyone who needs to know that more than ever tonight, that you would help them to have peace, that you would draw close and that they would know your comfort at hand. Father, we thank you. And it's in Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen. All right, guys, we'll be back in a few minutes. I hope you take a couple of minutes just to think through those things. And we'll talk to you soon.